Oh, doy. All I had to do was click the go live button. That was dumb. Uh, okay, let's see how much of a delay this is for how crazy. Um, oh, doy. All I had to do was click the go live button. That was dumb. Uh, okay, can someone in the chat... Uh, okay, let's Tell see me how much of a delay this is. Oh, nice. For how crazy. Um, oh, doy. All I had to do was click the go live button. Thank you. That was dumb. Uh, okay, so thanks everybody for joining the stream. Um, very excited to have this be kind of a part of like a weekly series, uh, most likely for the rest of the year. Um, as a quick note, I think from what I can tell on my end, uh, it's maybe like a 30 second delay, um, maybe 45 second delay. So just be aware of that. Um, I, however, what's a little strange is the chat is instant. So if you type something in the chat, I'm going to read it instantly. But then by the time you hear me respond, it's going to be like 30 seconds later. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I believe that's roughly the delay I, I'm experiencing here. Maybe like 45 seconds. Um, well, I don't have a clock here to time it. Uh, so is... <laughs> um, I think it's just a, an internet upload issue on my end. I have like, a, for whatever reason, it's only like a one megabyte per second or two megabyte per second upload. And YouTube recommended five. So we're about <laughs> a fifth there. So we'll just have to kind of deal with that delay. But it's just a delay. Um, hopefully it's not a huge uh, issue in general. I'm going to bring in over the windows. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right. So this is the first live stream and just in case I messed anything up and just in case like this wasn't recorded, uh, this should be recorded. It should be available after this is done. So if you want to later on revisit this, um, we, we will save it. I have it under DVR settings, so it should save everything. Uh, just in case for the very uh, live stream, whoops, all right, there we go. So you'll see in, in just a second here. Um, just in case anything messed up, what I wanted to do for the very first uh, live stream was work through the course capstone project together. Um, I know that can be a little annoying because technically you, that's already part of the course, but I just really wanted to make sure that uh, I didn't do something completely new and then if I messed up the streaming, it would be lost forever. So. For this week's live stream, we're going to do something that technically you already have access to. Next week's live stream, we're going to do a data source that um, will most likely kind of never be a part of the official course. Uh, obviously, we'll save the video for you to revisit, um, but we will. Um, uh, someone said it's cut. I'm not sure what that means. We'll see. Um, uh, later on, we'll see hopefully um, some new data sets. Um, either. I'm kind of tempted to do something on an election-based data set or a COVID-19 data set, since those are quite robust these days um, and they have a lot of interesting information, but uh, maybe we won't. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. It is cut, isn't it? Um, I can fix that on the video capture. Maybe I can't. Dun, dun, dun. One second, thank you for letting me know about that. And boom, that should have fixed it more or less. I may have to make myself smaller. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna wait a couple of seconds. This might be annoying at first because of the delay. All right, um, can someone tell me? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Patricia, for telling me we're good to go. Uh, okay, so this is gonna be repetitive again. But again, so we'll do the capstone project together. I think it's a really fun, interesting capstone project. And then next week, we're going to do something kind of totally new that's not uh, really part of the um, the official course. Um, so maybe we'll do like, um, I kind of want to do something like possibly if it's the election data, maybe try to duplicate like 538's model or maybe part of it um, just to see how it goes. 
Um, probably better to do that after election day here in the United States than before it. Um, but yeah, so, so it should be a bunch of interesting stuff. But uh, for this week's, we're gonna do something. We're gonna do the capstone project together. Um, that way, you can also ask me questions. I can see them in the chat. And uh, later on, there's also some people posted questions on the Google Forms, so we'll be doing that as well. Um, this session will probably go on maybe about an hour-ish. I think I think it'll probably end towards 11. We'll see how fast we go through the project um, and how many questions there are. Um, there's no set timeline. Okay, after I had my hit of LaCroix. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we start? I know it's going to be like a 15 second delay before I actually answer them, but you can go ahead and chat. I'll wait. I guess I have to wait. I feel like I'm in Tenet or something, like the, the time dilation, maybe Interstellar. Uh, let's see. I'll wait for anything in the questions. Um, I don't see anything, but feel free to post a question as we go along. I do have the chat window open on a second monitor. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully everything's working. Let's get started. Uh, what kind of capstone are we looking at? Great question. Let's go into that. I don't know machine learning. Well, luckily, this lecture um, is technically not a uh, machine learning project. Uh, for this particular project, um, what we're going to do is when I say capstone, it's kind of a capstone for NumPy and Pandas. Um, so we're going to cover a little bit of visualization, a little bit of Pandas, a little bit of NumPy. Um, you definitely don't have to have finished the course, but uh, you should know a little bit of NumPy or Pandas to really follow along. If you don't know anything, uh, maybe you only know basic Python, that's totally okay too. This should hopefully give you an idea of what's possible. Um, you can hopefully follow along. Maybe you won't understand every single line of code, but you will understand kind of the basic gist of what is possible to do with Python. Okay, a couple more questions we saw here. Um, uh, let's hopefully that answer the capstone project. Uh, how big is this new machine learning course gonna be? Uh, it's going to be really big. Um, <laughs> the reason I, I released it early was because we already hit 20 hours, which is almost the length of the older course. And I thought, well, I might as well just release it. So um, we're going to cover way more uh, in-depth algorithms, both I think the theory and the actual implementation of them. So uh, for instance, it's the older course just had linear regression. This new course goes way more in-depth behind um, gradient descent and how we actually solve um, ordinary least squares behind linear regression. And then it goes way deeper into regularization behind linear regression. So it goes into things like uh, L1 versus L2. Um, so like lasso regression versus ridge regression. And then also elastic net. Um, if you just completed the bootcamp course, uh, I think you might be a little lost in the actual code part, but you should it should be fun to see what's possible. Um, uh, okay. I think those are all the questions. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead. How big will the course be in hours? Um, I'm just guessing right now at least three times what it currently is, which would mean like 60 hours. So very, very large, for better or for worse. <laughs> OK, so I mean, do I have to complete the course to attend this session? Uh, no, you don't need to attend uh, complete the course to attend this session. You just needed to hopefully know a little bit of pandas, maybe a little bit of visualization. Uh, all right, so what we're going to do here is I'm saying let's put all your current skills together. So I'm kind of walking through what the capstone project would look like. And so what we're going to do is um, I want to quickly review where a project would like this would be for a machine learning pathway. This project technically doesn't use any machine learning. It's kind of all the skills right before you would hit using machine learning and scikit-learn. So um, if you've done the course, I know my face is blocking some of this, um, but uh, if you've done this course, you're going to see uh, this kind of ML pathway a lot. It's something we start right at the beginning of the course and we kind of constantly reflect back on like where we are. So the way I like to think about uh, data science and the machine learning pathway is there's kind of two ways to segment this. One is if you are trying to solve a particular problem like how do I fix or change X out in the real world? Or if you're trying to do something a little more analytical, like you're trying to say, just answer a question, how does a change in X affect Y? Um, and so for the question to answer, I, I would say that kind of falls more under data analysis versus trying to build a data product that requires machine learning. So for that, um, 
we're going to say we're trying to answer a question instead of trying to uh, create a product to actually solve a problem. That will require machine learning later on. So what we're going to do is we're essentially going to follow what I would call here um, not the machine learning pathway in full, but really kind of data analysis up to the fact of where you would actually need to then machine learning um, or control. And you can, my face is covering this, but there's a block called data analysis where my face is. I'm going to move my face for a second so you can see it. But there's data analysis. All right, let me move my face back. Whoop. Okay. Um, so this is what I would call a kind of data analysis pathway. We start from the real world. We need to collect and store data. We need to clean and organize that data. We'll perform exploratory data analysis. And then there's many different ways you can create something after exploratory data analysis. Maybe you want to just create a quick report for your boss. Maybe you want to create a nice visualization, also maybe for your boss or for your colleagues. Or maybe you just want this to be communicated. Maybe it's a, a quick question. Somebody asks you, um, did this new advertising campaign affect sales? And at that point, it, maybe you just need to send them an email and say, yes, it did affect sales. Um, they're up 60% or something like that. Um, this can all be done with data analysis. And a lot of times, I think, especially students that are new to machine learning and new to a lot of these Python libraries, they get a little confused because um, they immediately want to jump to machine learning when really they can actually just use basic data analysis to answer a question. So we're going to see what kind of uh, questions and what kind of um, situations would something like just data analysis without machine learning um, be useful for. Um, all right, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat. Um, yeah, there's definitely going to be more stuff added to the course. Uh, okay, so moving along. So essentially, the technologies we're going to use right now, or the Python libraries we're going to use right now, are Jupyter Notebook, um, a little bit of NumPy, and then definitely heavily on Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. And luckily, Pandas and Seaborn, a lot of that are just one-liners. So even if you're not fully familiar with those uh, libraries, it should be pretty easy to interpret what they're actually doing. And then you can revisit the course to get more hands-on with the actual syntax behind those libraries. OK, so uh, I had a lot of fun making this project for the course. Um, so there's a question that we're going to answer. And the question we want to answer is, um, is there a conflict of interest for a website that both sells movie tickets and displays review ratings? And you may have heard of this, but um, for this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of, uh, <laughs> a lot of time travel in today's discussion, but we're going to travel back in time to the year 2015. So we will invert our entropy. But uh, all joking aside, um, if you're, I'm not sure if Fandango is an international company, actually, but if you're in the United States, um, you probably heard about Fandango. Um, essentially, what Fandango does is they sell movie tickets online. And so if we travel back in time in our minds to uh, 2015 and we think about uh, Fandango, they're selling movie tickets online. However, what's also important to note is that Fandango also displays movie ratings online. And so what we're kind of starting to think of is, is there going to be a conflict of interest here between selling movie tickets for any movie and also displaying their movie ratings? And basically to point out, like, why would you just tell anybody that the movie is bad? Otherwise, they're not going to buy a ticket, right? Um, so we want to actually see quantitatively, can we prove um, whether or not this is a factor for Fandango? And technically, this data is all coming back from 2015. So to give you an example, um, <laughs> not to... Uh, hit on this movie too much, but if you went back in time to 2015 and you looked um, at the Fandango rating for a movie like Taken 3, you would see that Taken 3 has a four and a half star rating on Fandango. So you travel back in time, it's the weekend, you say, oh, I want to go see a movie. Um, let me go check out what movies um, are on. You go to Fandango.com and you see, oh, Taken 3, four and a half star rating on Fandango. It must be a pretty good movie, right? I'll go see it. Um, no offense to anyone here that really enjoyed Taken 3. Um, it's definitely a particular type of experience. But it's highly likely, as far as um, <laughs> the cinematography experience of Taken 3, you may have been disappointed. Um, and since you're probably on YouTube watching this, you may want to <laughs> do a Google search of uh, Taken 3 fence jump scene. There's about, I think, like 20 cuts for like a five second scene. Um, I see in the chat someone said Taken 3 is bad. I would agree with you. Again, don't want to quash on anybody's um, uh, movie tastes. But let's just say 
almost universally across the board, um, even on the Wikipedia article, it's pretty well known Taken 3 is not the best film ever made, right? However, if you went back to 2015 um, and visited Fandango, they rated it four and a half stars. So is this an issue of just kind of, oh, an unlucky rating for Fandango? Or is Fandango actually kind of boosting the ratings artificially for movies because it will sell more tickets if the movies have high ratings? So that's the question we're trying to answer. So this is where we begin to ask ourselves as kind of um, from a data scientist position, is there a conflict of interest for a website that is both selling movie tickets and displaying review ratings? And can we actually answer this question with data analysis? Um, to kind of point this out, it's never a good thing if uh, your company's website has a controversies page. Um, so for our capstone project here that we're going to be going through, uh, there's a really fun article um, from 538. Again, it's from the year 2015, but they actually perform an analysis um, that says be suspicious of online movie ratings, especially of Fandango's, uh, because there's a conflict of interest there. So we want to see if we can repeat and find the same uh, findings here that this article did back in 2015. Uh, any questions so far? I just realized I'll have to wait like 15 seconds for a question to show up. Um, you may hear me answer those questions later on. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do for the following is we will technically need to scrape review websites. That portion has actually already been done for us, and I'll show you where we get the data in just a second. We'll need to use pandas to organize this data, answer maybe a few questions, and then we're going to use Seaborn to explore and see hopefully with maybe some visualization if we can answer this with a report, um, some sort of communication, and perform some sort of uh, data analysis. So really we're focusing on using pandas to organize and using Seaborn to explore data. To answer the question, does Fandango display artificially um, higher than average reviews? Okay, so something to note here for Fandango um, is it actually has two ratings in the data set we're going to visit. And I'll, I'll explain more about where we actually can get this data set. It is already part of your course um, as part of that zip file. So you can go ahead and download it. It should be both, I think, available under the data folder and the capstone folder but I'll show you in a second. Or you can also download it from the GitHub. Um, I'm gonna show you 538's GitHub because it has a lot of fun data sets there. Okay, so back to this discussion on the fact that it has two ratings. It has a stars rating and the rating in stars is gonna be zero through five. And that's actually the stars rating that is displayed on the HTML. Then it also has a column called rating, which is the actual true rating numerically shown on the movies page. So you might be thinking, why are there like kind of two uh, columns here that are showing the same value? The main reason for that is because just display wise, they can't really fill in a star to like 4.4 stars out of five. So what they do is in the HTML, they're just gonna display that as 4.5 out of five stars. Um, that's not unreasonable, right? It's kind of really hard to fill in a star to like 4.4 instead of just a full 4.5. Um, that this, that ability to distinguish is going to be hard for any user on that page. So we can't really knock Fandango for having a difference between stars versus rating. But is it going to be an extreme difference between stars versus rating? So that's something else we're going to be exploring. So what we want to do is build out some plots like this. I want to first compare the true rating of the film versus the stars being displayed. You'll notice that there's actually a slight discrepancy. The stars being displayed tends to be rounded up. And then what I want to do is compare Fandango's rating to ratings across other websites. So I want to have an overview of the project exercise notebook. Again, just to make sure we have no issues, this, this project is already part of the course. Um, in the next week's stream, we're going to do something kind of that's not really part of the course. Um, that's more like exclusive to the streams. Um, okay, so if you have not already done this, uh, download the zip file for the course. Um, Actually, some people have been asking me uh, what's going to be added to the course. You can see here kind of fully what we're working on. But for your case, you're not going to have all this. You should just be able to see um, these folders. I'm going to zoom in here. So go ahead and download the zip file that comes with the course. And what we're working on is essentially after NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn, and it's under Capstone Project. I'm going to load that up. 
and I'm going to be working through the Capstone Project Notebook. Uh, whoops. Oh, stop. And then we're going to be working with this all site scores.csv and then something called fandango scrape.csv. So if you haven't, again, done so already, go ahead and download the zip file from the course, and it can be found in the course overview lecture. Um, in case you, for some reason, can't download that zip, or you're just curious about where I got these CSV files from, we got them from the the actual article here for 538, where it's like, be suspicious of the online movie ratings. There's actually a GitHub associated with kind of these articles on 538. So if we check out uh, GitHub 538, load that up, you'll notice there's actually a GitHub page for 538. And this particular one, I have to look and see what it's called. Uh, I think it's called like movie re reviews or film reviews, but it's essentially somewhere, for, oh, here it is. It's called the Fandango folder. So this is where I got the data from, in case you were wondering. Um, you could technically also just download it here yourself if you didn't have that zip already, but I'd recommend you just go with the zip because we, then we already have a structured notebook for you to follow along with me. Um, and probably what's gonna happen is later on, if we do decide to do like an election forecast uh, data set, we'll, we'll also do it from 538. But there's obviously lots of different things here that you can also explore. So I'd, I definitely encourage you to check a lot of this stuff out, a lot of fun. Um, data sets here to play around with in case you're wondering of like what's a good uh, data source if you're kind of tired of Kaggle. Um, the GitHub repo for the course is hidden um, but the zip file is available for you. Um, any any questions so far? I will answer these in 20 seconds if you post them right now because of delay. Uh, Okie dokie. So what I'm gonna do is come to Capstone Project I've made a copy of the Capstone project, so maybe you want to also make a copy in case you want to go through the project yourself someday. Um, but I've made a copy here, and I've opened it here. And so what we're going to do is essentially work with that CSV file and see if we uh, can't figure out what uh, is going on. Maybe they are uh, boosting the scores, maybe they're not. I also see the stream freezing every once in a while, but I'm not sure if there's something I can do on that. Um, Uh, I'm also not sure if it if it works if we pause it, um, and then if you uh, let it like buffer. Um, YouTube told me it was going to buffer, so I don't know if that will actually help or not. Um, Okie dokes. So let me bring this in. Yeah, I see it also freezing on my end. I put some chapstick on. Uh, okay. Let me see if anyone posted any questions. Sir, this time Panda's lecture is whopping six hours. Yeah, tell me about it, man. Uh, the freezing spikes. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see if that's something we can fix uh, later on. I think it's, in general, it's like an internet issue. Um, I'm also not sure if it makes a difference that I'm like also viewing the stream at the same time I'm trying to like post to it. Uh, so we'll see. Let's see, YouTube's complaining it's not receiving enough enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Uh, we'll see, that's an issue. Yeah, I can see that it's kind of going back. I guess something you can also do to fix that, um, as far as like the stream freezing, is you should be able to like go back a little bit or just pause. Um, and then essentially what's happening from my understanding is everything's being encoded on my end, then pushed to YouTube. And so if there's a delay in that, it's gonna keep freezing as it pushes that encoding. So maybe just like, at the cost of a two to three minute delay of between this video and the chat, um, you should be able to like pause, go back in time and see the full stream without any freezing. So um, that, that's my best advice. Um, yeah, I'm just seeing, if I'm watching a stream, I just saw myself put uh, chapstick on, which was maybe like a minute ago. So uh, hopefully this isn't too bad of an experience for you guys, but yeah, my best advice would be to pause. Um, uh, I don't think I actually have an option to reduce the resolution on my end. It's something I'm trying to figure out myself, um, unless you're talking to the other chat people to reduce their resolution. Uh, my best advice, again, is to pause, go back a little, rewatch some of it, and hopefully by the time you're getting up to it, it's no longer freezing. Um, 
Alrighty, so I'm gonna hopefully this will be a nice experience for you. Let's let's code this out. Um, I'm gonna all of this that's written here is mainly just explanation for what I just talked about in the slides. So I'm gonna scroll down and let's import any libraries we think we're gonna use as part of this. I'm just gonna import the basics here. I'm gonna say import uh, numpy as np, import pandas as pd import matplotlib as pyplot, whoops, import matplotlib.pyplot. And then I'm going to say uh, import seaborn as SNS. So let's go ahead and run that. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit here. So hopefully then maybe if you reduce the uh, resolution, you can still see it. Uh, someone asked, I don't know what 538 refers to. 538 is the actual name of the website that is doing this sort of data analysis. So if you can actually search um, for 538.com, and it's it's very famous for uh, political forecasting. Um, they tend to be the most accurate uh, forecasting. It's by this guy called Nate Silver. Um, it's, it's very heavily political right now, just because we're in the middle of an election and we're just a few days away. But they also do a lot of stuff on like sports and science. So um, they tend to do a lot of sports analytics as well. Um, I, I uh, There was a quick question here on uh, how far down will you have to be in the course? Um, what I'm probably gonna do is in the next stream, say like, you should know this, this, this. Um, is there a link to it in the course? Yeah, there is. In this notebook, I, I link to the, the articles here. I also link to the GitHub in case you want to check that out. Um, okay. Um, so let's try this out. Um, hopefully now it's not too bad as far. Um, and this is kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do a project that you already have for the live stream in case there was any like freezing issues. Um, but kind of bear with me as this is my first uh, video stream um, of all time <laughs> or ever. Uh, definitely I'm not a, like a YouTube gamer streamer, but who knows, maybe that's the next career for me. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of tasks here in this notebook. Let's try it out. Uh, first thing I wanna do is run the cell below to read in the fandango scrape.csv file. So Fandango scrape.csv file, I'm gonna read it in and let's go ahead and explore it, check it out. You'll notice that the expected output is listed here. So you're gonna see the expected output and then kind of me repeating it. Um, this is how all our projects are set up throughout the course. That way you can know whether or not you did the right thing. So I just read in Fandango underscore scrape.csv. As a reminder, this is available to you in your zip folder under capstone project, right here, all site scores.csv, Fandango scrape.csv. If you went straight for 538 and read in Fandango, um, I think they call these CSV files slightly different. They call it like Fandango scrape.csv and Fandango score comparison. So slightly different names there, just something to keep in mind. Um, let's check out Fandango. All right, so it looks like there's 504 rows by four columns. We have what appears to be the film and then in parentheses, the year that film came out, the stars for that film. So four stars, four and a half stars and then the rating. So as I, I explained earlier, um, this rating is essentially on the back end what Fandango actually knows the true rating to be. And then stars is what is being displayed in the HTML, the actual like stars being filled out on the website. Makes sense that they're gonna be slightly different sometimes because I can't really fill in 3.9 stars. So I'm just gonna fill in four stars on the HTML. We know already that this is to some degree forgivable for Fandango and for any website really, right? But is it gonna be forgivable if there's an extreme difference between the true ratings um, versus the stars? You'll also notice that just by default, this is actually rated by votes. So you can see 50 Shades of Grey had the most votes for the rating. Um, so the Jurassic World here, et cetera. Um, okay. And then we, we also have a bunch of, something that's gonna be important later on is you'll notice there's a bunch of films that have no ratings. Uh, this is not going to be useful to us in an analysis to see if they're actually boosting ratings, if there are no ratings. So that's something we may have to remove later on, something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so moving along, we can also check out things like Fandango info, 
again, Fandango's name, my data frame here. Um, uh, oh, Fandango, spelled that wrong. Hopefully I don't make too many mistakes as I'm filming this. Um, and we can see here again, 504, looks like it's taking up 16 kilobytes of info, uh, not a big deal. Um, and what's also nice to know is you can see there's not any missing values. There's no null values. There are definitely zero values, but there's nothing that just says like straight up NA, NA. Uh, okay, and then what we can also do, what I like to do, is whenever you first get a data set after calling info and checking the head, I also like to call describe. Describe recall, if you're already familiar with pandas, or if you're not, that's okay too. Um, describe is going to tell you just statistical information. So it's going to tell you the max and minimum values. So I can see like the minimum votes are zero, max votes is 34,000, almost 35,000. Um, and then we can also see the quartiles. So quartiles, recall, are if you were to split up the data into four equally sized number of rows. Um, so what that means is, for example, at the 50% mark, that means 50% of all movies have less than 18.5 votes, and 50% of all movies have more than 18.5 votes. Um, and then it's the same for like 25%. So uh, something later on that you may want to check out is the way box plots work. If you haven't seen the box plot lecture, it's also heavily based off these quartiles. Um, and then we can see the mean and standard deviation off of this. Also kind of interesting to see. So what's really interesting here is right off the bat, I can see that on average, stars is 3.55 and rating is 3.37. In theory, these should be exactly the same if I was able to display um, values perfectly one-to-one. -one. So if there was some rating in the back end and I was able to perfectly display 3.7 stars, in theory, the rating and the stars would be exactly the same. I can already see on average, the mean of the stars being displayed is higher than the true rating Fandango has on the back end. And already, hopefully, your kind of analytical mind should be scratching its head and thinking, hmm, that's a little suspicious that overall, the stars are being pushed higher than the rating. You would think that if you did have this issue of not being able to display stars, there should be some times where you're actually kind of rounding down, right? So for example, if your true rating was 4.1, you would think that you would display this as 4.0. Um, but it looks like on average, uh, I almost said Udemy, <laughs> Fandango is pushing stuff higher. So already a little suspicious that they're not evening out. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And we already got this just from the describe call. And this is kind of to point out that you don't need something as crazy as the latest machine learning algorithm or deep learning just to make this um, kind of analysis here. Okay, there was a quick question in the chat. Will I be doing streams every Sunday at this time? Uh, maybe we'll do a survey as far as what the best stream time is. It, it's really hard for us because uh, our student base is kind of split in half between United States and India, which are like exactly on opposite sides of the globe, which is kind of annoying um, from, my, from the perspective of choosing a nice stream time. Um, so we'll have to see what the best time is. Um, this time obviously works for me, but uh, obviously we'll also be recording these streams. Um, and there's always going to be Google Form questions ahead of time in case you want to uh, ask a question. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here is let's explore the relationship between the popularity of the film and its rating. So I want to kind of create this scatter plot here. And the way I'm going to do that is let me zoom out just a little bit here. Okay, so what I can do is if you're familiar with Seaborn, what it allows you to do is simply say SNS scatter plot. And if you do shift tab here, it's kind of self-explanatory what it does is it takes in a data set such as a pandas data frame. And then it's going to take in your X and your Y, and then it's gonna create a scatter plot from that. So what I can do here is say data is equal to Fandango I'm going to say X, whoops, these are actually in all caps. I want to do rating versus votes. And if you run that, you get something like this. And later on in the Seaborn section of the course, we actually explain you can edit this figure size with matplotlib. I also make it sharper. We can do PLT figure, fig size equal to 10.4 or 10 by four. And DPI, you can just make it a little sharper. It says PLT is not defined. Let's make sure we actually ran that. Do, 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 do. Uh, that was dumb as PLT. There we go. It's kind of hard to talk and encode at the same time. So I messed up this import here. This should have been matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. 
Um, you could have also done it as PyPlot, but in general, the convention is PLT. Sorry about that. There we go. Now we get this nice scatter plot. So why do this scatter plot, and what does the scatter plot tell us? If anything, not every plot is going to be informative, right? So here I'm seeing rating on the x-axis versus votes. This should answer the question, is there a relationship between how many votes a movie gets versus its rating? I would say there's maybe, a, we can also check this through correlation. It looks like there's a little bit of a relationship between um, that the higher a movie is rated, the more votes it tends to get. A little hard to tell. It doesn't, because some movies have like very few ratings or zero ratings. Um, is this expected? I would say yes, because intuitively we can think if a movie is really good, it's more likely that people are going to watch it, right? Um, and if more people are going to watch it, then it means there's going to be more ratings. So there should be some sort of positive correlation between the number of votes a movie gets versus its rating. The higher rated movies are going to get more people to watch them. Um, the more people watch a movie, the more votes that are going to be rated. It's kind of like this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy here. Um, it's not an extreme uh, relationship here. Um, so, and you also you also notice that it looks like uh, there's kind of these little steps here. You'll notice that there's kind of always this nice even spacing between rating. And that's because the kind of highest precision possible on a rating is a 0.1. It goes from 2.1 to 2.2, 2.3, etc. Um, that's why you kind of see it more like a step. All right. So I just mentioned you could also do this with correlation. The way to do this is just say Fandango or whatever your data frame is and call a correlation there. Um, so also right off the bat, you can see there is technically some issue uh, between stars and rating. They are not perfectly correlated. So that already informs you that the rating uh, behind the scenes is not the same as the stars being shown. Uh, whether or not that's suspicious kind of depends. And it also shows you there's a positive correlation between the votes people get versus stars and ratings. Obviously, it's not a perfect one-to-one, -one, but it is positive. Um, it's not zero. Again, makes sense, given what we just talked about, that it should be a positive correlation. So everything's looking um, pretty good here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skip some of these tasks just to let you have the opportunity uh, to do them on your own in case you want to revisit this since you already have this notebook. Obviously, in later streams, um, we won't do the same thing. But there's going to be certain tasks that are more like kind of playing around than actually uh, answering the question. So you'll see me skip some of these as we, we go around. Um, one of them is actually grabbing the year. And as a quick note, you have the solutions notebook for this as well. So if there's something you want to actually check out, the solutions is there for you. Uh, but continuing on. Um, uh, continuing on, we have film title name. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip this one that just uh, goes through the years, mainly because pretty much all the movies are from the year 2015. And there's just a few from 2014 and other years. Uh, so we'll kind of go along here, and this is the expected output. So like I said, pretty much all the movies are uh, from 2015 and 2014. It's not a very informative thing for the question we're trying to uh, answer. Um, taking a quick look at the chat, since I'm like four minutes delayed or maybe even five minutes delayed. Uh, someone says they're from Russia with angry face. <laughs> I guess it depends on what side of Russia you are and how bad the time is. Um, okay. Uh Oh, someone from Nigeria. Very cool. Okay. Uh, visualize counts of movies per year. I'm not going to go through this one because, that's, again, it's kind of year. That doesn't help answer the question of because we're really dealing with ratings. Um, and then what are the 10 movies with the highest number of votes? This is actually kind of easy to do. One is they're already in that order of number of votes. You could just grab the top 10 rows from the beginning. But something we can do as well is say Fandango. And something I'm now using all the time with pandas is n smallest and n largest. So n smallest, the way it works is you say grab the kind of smallest value, n number of smallest value rows based off some columns. Or you can say grab n largest, same thing, based off some columns. So the way this works is it's going to be like grab the 10 largest values based off votes and it returns back a data frame that looks like this. So I could also uh, do this for kind of any value here. Votes makes the most sense. So I could say n smallest. And it's essentially going to be a bunch of um, zeros here. So n smallest, n largest, super useful function. 
um, it essentially saves you a sort values call. The other way to do this would be to sort the entire data frame first and then grab either the head or the tail of it. But this is kind of a two for one call. So we can see here uh, kind of the most popular movies of 2015 and maybe 2014. Uh, it kind of makes sense that 2014 is here because I think that was, or The Hobbit was released, I think in like December holiday season. So it kind of makes sense that it started to drift again towards um, uh, January if, if this was a data set for just like 2015 because the article came out in 2015. So I believe that's the reason we have some older movies in here that are not exactly uh, 2015. Um, there was a question here. I'm, I'm seeing a delay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there was a question I just saw based off what I plotted earlier, which was what was the code to reformat the plot? It is scrolling all the way back up here. Uh, I don't know if this is useful to you guys, this delay, but it's PLT figure and you can choose a fig size, which is like the actual size you want to stretch it to. And DPI just makes that image a little sharper because the default DPI for Jupiter, I think is too low. Um, that's why it looks a little sharper. All right, moving along. And I'm sorry for the annoyance of me. I'm going to be answering questions that are like three minutes delayed here. Um, in fact, I'm going to type it out right now. All right, uh, so I just typed that out. So you'll see me actually talk about that in the chat. Uh, okay, um, so let's again, we really want to focus on ratings here, right? So what I'm going to do is I don't want to, I'm going to move down to this task of create a data frame of only the reviewed films by removing any films that have zero votes. It makes sense that I'm not going to be able to answer this question of Fandango uh, essentially boosting the scores of movies if the scores of movies or ratings of movies have no actual rating. So how can we do this with pandas? What I can do is create a data frame called no votes. And I'm going to say it's going to be where votes um, is greater than zero. And then what I have to do is then call this back into or pass this back into Fandango. So all this is doing again is it's going to say, where is Fandango number of votes greater than zero? And only grab those votes. votes. Um, and I don't want to call this no votes. Um, I actually want to call this something else. Let's call it fan reviewed. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to say this fan reviewed data frame is where Fandango votes is greater than zero. Okay, run that. Uh, Okie dokes. Um, so if I take a look at fan reviewed, and sorry if I'm messing up some variable names here. It's, it's a little hard to talk, view the chat, and type this all at the same time. Hopefully you can forgive me for that. But what we can see here is all of these have at least one vote. Somebody reviewed it. Um, okay, so we have the fan reviewed data frame. What we're going to do here is continue on. So, and this is what we talked about in the slides. As noted in the article, um, and this is where we get our first real visualization to answer the question. And it's amazing what kind of questions you can answer just with a visualization. But as noted in the article, due to the HTML and star rating displays, the true user rating held on the back end is probably going to be slightly different than the rating shown to the user. Again, if I have a rating on the back end of 4.1, I can't display 4.1 stars. I can only display 4 or 4.5. Um, so what I want to do is just plot out those differences and do this with a KDE plot. And the reason I created this data frame of only the fan reviewed is because when I'm creating this plot, I only want to consider things that actually have a vote on them. Otherwise, I would get like a big spike at zero stars, which wouldn't really make any sense. So let's go ahead and create this KDE plot. Many different ways you can actually do this. We can also do this with like a histogram. So I'll show you many different ways you can actually plot this out. But essentially what I want to do is create something like this. Um, so what I'll say is the following. I'm going to say Seaborn dot KDE plot. And let's say the data is fan reviewed. So I'm only considering things that have a review. And let's say X is equal to rating column. And let's just see what happens here. So you get something that looks like this, 
right off the bat, you'll notice it's a little blurry. So what I'm going to do is off of this at the top, uh, somebody, I think Stephen or Stefan was asking this, is how do we make this figure a little sharper? I'm going to say figure is equal to fig size 10 by 4. Obviously, you can play around with that. Um, I'm I'm super zoomed in on my browser, so you may have to adjust that figure size as necessary. Um, and let's make the DPI a little sharper. Let's say 150 should be sharp enough for our use case. Okay, so here I see a KDE plot. Um, we have a pretty expansive discussion on how this is actually calculated, but for the case of this stream, the way you can think of a KDE plot is it's just showing you the distribution as a nice curve. Um, this is calculated with the summation of like uh, Gaussian distributions at every single point, and then it sums that up. Um, we go much deeper into that discussion inside the course, so you can actually see the um, super detailed discussion on how you actually calculate KDE plots inside the course. For right now, because I don't want to spend like half an hour explaining what this plot looks like, I'm just going to say um, that just think of this as a curve that's showing you the distribution. So if I'm looking at this, I can see that on average, the ratings tend to be um, kind of three, four, and five stars. With the peak, most movies are rated four stars. Is that suspicious already? A little hard to tell, right? It's kind of strange that there are not many one and two star movies in this data set. But maybe those, maybe nobody goes to see those movies because they are not very good. Um, so maybe this distribution does make sense. So recall the rating here. That is the true rating held in the back end. But let's now see the stars being displayed. How can I do that? I'm going to create another KDE plot. And again, fan reviewed. And we're going to say x is equal to stars. And recall stars is what is actually being shown to the user visiting Fandango in the year 2015. So we run that. And now I see something that looks like this. And what I can do here is I can add in labels in order to see a legend so I don't get these curves mixed up. So what I'll do here is I'll say label is equal to true rating and then the stars label is equal to stars displayed. And I think now I have to zoom out so you can see the whole code. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit here. Um, and hopefully this kind of gives you the logic of how, I, uh, at least I personally thought of building out these plots. Um, keep in mind, these plots are heavily inspired from the plots in the article. So oops, if we go back to that article, I think it's the last page I visited here. Be suspicious. Yeah, so if you go to this article, they actually end up building um, kind of very similar plots here. Specifically, it, it's kind of this plot that we're trying to do, except I'm showing it for both the stars and the rating. They just do it for the rating here. But you'll notice there's like hardly any one to two star ratings. Um, okay, so I uh, just saw someone from Germany, Guten Tag. Um, okay, or well, who knows, is it nighttime there? <laughs> okay, so a uh, couple of issues with this KDE plot. Something that's an issue is uh, I haven't actually shown these labels yet, so if I want to show them, after I assign the labels, I need to say PLT legend, and if you run that, it will produce the legend here. And then later on, you can actually see the code that we can move that legend wherever we want. But uh, a couple issues here. Uh, one, right off the bat, can you answer the question, um, is the stars displayed to a user greater than the true rating it holds on the back end? And in general, it is yes. The stars look like they're being boosted a little bit. Um, is that forgivable? I think so. But what should be kind of making you think is, why is it not... Uh, averaging out in general, right? Um, why is Fandango overall not matching stars display the true rating? Uh, it kind of doesn't make sense that it's always above the true rating. You would think that on average, it kind of should even itself out, right? Um, all those movies with a 4.1 true rating should probably average out to display like a 4.0 versus the 4.4 movies will display a little higher. So you should, if you were doing this correctly um, and didn't have a conflict of interest, be able to kind of even yourself out on stars displayed versus true rating, just because when you round stuff, sometimes it should be about half the time a little lower, half the time a little higher. So we can already see we're a little suspicious here that every single time it looks like your stars displayed is higher. 
Um, that's a little weird. Okay. Uh, the second thing I want to fix here is you'll notice by the nature of the KDE curve, because it's smoothing everything out, uh, it is going and extending past five stars, and it's actually it's extending a little bit past zero. Uh, so you can actually fix this with a clip argument. And the reason we can clip this is I know there's no movies greater than five stars um, because that's the limit of the rating. So what you can do is you can add in this clip argument that is essentially your higher and lower limit for actually clipping that curve. Um, this is different than just shrinking the plot down. So I can add clips here to both just to fix that issue. Okay, and if you want, after you clip, it may make sense to actually shade this in because it's a little hard to tell what's happening here. So you can also say shade, or it's actually fill. I think it's actually both are okay. Fill is equal to true. Let's put that in there. So run that, and I can see now my plot. And we can also move this legend around. I can say location is equal to somewhere else. I can say location is equal to, we can actually just put it off uh, like 1.2, 0 0.5. This kind of moves that legend anywhere we want. Uh, okay, and that's how I made the plot. Uh, Okie dokie, artichoke. So we have now already answered the question that there is a discrepancy between the stars being displayed and the true rating. So now what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna see and actually calculate that star's uh, difference between them. And then we're gonna kind of jump ahead through some tasks and then kind of try to answer the final question. Okay, so going along, what I wanna do is actually quantify this discrepancy. And so what I mean by that is if I scroll down here, basically what I wanna do is create this plot. Um, which is the difference between the rating and the stars. You'll notice, and this is where you get extremely suspicious, there is no negative stars difference, which means every single time Fandango is displaying something to a user versus a true star rating, it is either going to be exactly the same as a star rating or higher. It will never be lower, which is crazy because if you're actually rounding this, in theory, it should be lower at some time. Um, so we're already very suspicious of Fandango for doing this. Um, so the way we need to do this is we need to calculate this star's difference column, which is essentially the difference between the stars being displayed versus the true uh, value. So what I'm going to do here is the following. I'm going to say, and I'm just going to do it all in this cell. I'll say fan reviewed stars diff. Um, someone's getting error. Stefan, I think you passed in the wrong column if you're getting... Remember, you're only passing in ratings and stars. Yes, all, all the visualizations we see here are explained in the course. Uh, fan reviewed stars diff is equal to fan reviewed... And let's say stars... Minus fan reviewed rating. So that's going to be the actual difference again between the stars displayed versus rating. Um, so we'll run that. And you often get this error. Well, it's not really an error. It's a warning with uh, pandas. It's just telling you, hey, this calculation you derived, uh, fan reviewed, recall, is actually still pointing to the original Fandango data frame. So it's just telling you, uh, make sure you keep that in mind that you're not dealing with that original Fandango data frame. You're dealing with this kind of pointer to it with fan reviewed. So it's super common to get this warning. Uh, for our use case, we're, we're aware of this. Um, you could make a copy of the data frame with copy, but we don't need to do that for our case. Uh, okay. Um, and as a quick note, for people that are like getting errors, um, you can always check out the solutions um, in case you want to, you know, follow along there. Uh, okay, fan reviewed. Uh, what I want to do is let's go ahead and round these off to uh, the nearest decimal place. So we're also going to say stars diff. That way I can fairly compare them. Um, I'm going to say this is equal to... Fan reviewed stars diff. 
and I'm going to just call, there's a method you can call in pandas, which is round two. And again, you get this warning here. You can safely ignore this warning. It's just telling you, oh, by the way, you, you didn't make a copy of this. Um, all right, so what does this actually look like now? If I took a look at fan reviewed stars difference, it's just telling you the difference between the stars displayed and the rating behind the scenes. You'll notice, so for this one, 0 0.1, that means that the stars being displayed is higher by 0.1 versus the true rating. So that would mean something like Fandango uh, has a fully calculated rating based off people's votes or you know whatever they say the rating's based off of 4.9, but they're going to display five stars because they can't really display 4.9. Um, okay, so uh, fan reviewed stars diff. Uh, let's go ahead and make this into a bar plot that we can count to see the difference. So I can do this quite easily. I can simply say sns.countplot, and then we're going to say uh, data is equal to fan reviewed, x is equal to stars diff, and that's actually, I think, all we need. Okay, there it is. Um, Okay, SNS count plot. Obviously, this plot doesn't look as nice. So what I can begin to do is I can play with the color palette if I want to. I really like the magma color palette. Um, so that's that's what I like to do. Um, and this is basically the plot. Uh, Dominic, uh, Stefan already, well, uh, had the same issue. Um, or check solutions. Okay. Uh, it looks like, I think there's like a three minute delay, which is quite significant. Okie dokie. So, what does this count plot uh, tell us? And I, I saw a few comments of if this part's a little too advanced for you, then maybe sit back, don't worry too much about the code, but focus more on kind of the analytical thinking we're doing, the critical thinking behind this. Um, so if I'm looking at this count plot, does this make sense to me? Um, I would say it's very suspicious that all the differences are positive. So that's my number one suspicion. Fandango is never showing you a lower star displayed versus the rating it has behind the scenes. That's really weird because that means if they have a movie that is rated 4.1, they're displaying it as a 4.5 instead of a 4.0. Maybe that's forgivable. Um, it doesn't look like that's happening too often. You'll notice that uh, for the majority of cases, well, maybe not majority, but for a lot of cases, the star's difference is zero. And that's exactly what you would want, right? You would want the displayed stars to be the same as the rating. So that's okay. Um, but what's crazy here to me, and hopefully it's also crazy to you, is that you actually have a bar occurring at 1.0. So what does that mean? That means, and this is actually the, the next question, is there is a movie in this data set where Fandango is displaying a star rating a full point higher than the true rating they have on the back end. And that's almost like unforgivable, right? Um, so let's actually see what is that movie. So what we're going to do here, and it ends up being this movie I've never heard of, Turbo Kid, but we can see Fan Reviewed, where Fan Reviewed, recall we made this star's difference column. Is equal to one. We run this and we get back Turbo Kid. Um, so what happened was two people voted on this. Their rating was four stars. And for whatever reason, Fandango is displaying it as 5.0, which is kind of insane, right? Um, that they're displaying what is truly a four star movie as five stars. Uh, so we're already kind of really suspicious at Fandango just on the difference between their stars displayed and the ratings. 
However, we're still looking at this only in the vacuum of Fandango. So what we want to do, um, and I think I said this will last to 11. This is probably going to go to 11.30, my time. So we probably have like half hour left. Um, um, okay. So uh, what we want to do is now compare Fandango ratings to other sites. And what I have here is this all sites scores. I'm not going to go through every single visualization that the notebook asks of us, but I will show you kind of the most important ones. So I want to show you kind of what's left in this notebook. Um, and hopefully you should have still have a lot of fun kind of going through this project on your own uh, when it, when you get to it in the course. Um, uh, okay. Uh, someone asked me, uh, we're using the latest Seaborn version. Seaborn did change very recently, though, so keep that in mind. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to read in all the site scores.csv. And so if we check this out, what is all sites? All sites basically has those films and then what they're scoring on other websites. Um, let me check. Someone asked me what the version of Seaborn we're using. Uh, that is not the latest version. It is uh, okay. So what? Where were we? Uh, what all sites shows us is the rating on Rotten Tomatoes, Rotten Tomatoes users, Metacritic, Metacritic user, uh, IMDb, Metacritic, uh, and then some user counts for those. Um, and so there's two things I want to point out here: is that if you visit a website like Rotten Tomatoes, in fact, let's just visit it right now. RottenTomatoes.com. So if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, uh, let's just click a movie. Um, so like this Borat film just came out, right? You'll notice it has two ratings. One is the ratings from um, so-called official critics. And then the second rating is from the audience. So people that, <laughs> I'm sorry for this picture of Borat, uh, people who um, actually came in and, and did the user rating. So if we come back to our data set, that is the difference between, if we scroll over here, Rotten Tomatoes versus Rotten Tomatoes user. It's essentially, what do the critics say versus what do the users say? And it's the same for Metacritic and also Metacritic user. Um, so throughout this, the rest of this notebook, and to save a little bit of time, we're not going to do every single plot. Um, what, what we do is we compare critic reviews versus user reviews. And hopefully you kind of can see how to, to do this yourself. Um, it's just the SNS scatter plot call. And in general, you should see a positive correlation, right? Um, so you should see that the higher a Rotten Tomatoes overall user score is, the higher the Rotten Tomatoes uh, critic score is. Um, so it makes sense that these are more or less in line with each other. They shouldn't be perfect. You know, there's going to be sometimes a movie that is a bomb with the critics, but the people love maybe some sort of like a action flick or something like that. Um, and there's also going to be movies where uh, the critics love it, but users, maybe it's too boring for them or something like that. Um, so what we can do, and I'll do this just for Rotten Tomatoes, is to create a new column based off this possible difference. Um, and then we want to compare like mean difference. This is pretty easy to do. Uh, what we'll do here is something like this. I'm going to say, uh, one second, I'm going to grab all sites. and say the rotten difference is calculated as all sites rotten tomatoes minus all sites, and I think this one's rotten tomatoes user. So here I have the difference between the critic score versus the user's score. So let's actually check this out. Um, what I'm going to do is say, all sites, rotten difference. And let's just grab, on average, how far off they are. And because sometimes it can be positive versus negative, I'm going to say apply absolute value. Again, the reason I'm applying this absolute value is because maybe there's some instances where critics are scoring higher. Um, maybe there's some interests um, between uh, scoring lower. You know, Nathan, that's a very interesting 
um, point. Thank you for letting me know. I th I was under the impression that magma was actually specifically designed for colorblind people. Um, I know where this is. So someone just put in the chat. I also know that there's different kinds of colorblindness, so you know that that could also be an issue. Um, but there there is a color mapping. This was actually a big issue within Matplotlib over that palette choice. Um, so I'll use Veridus from now on. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, obviously I'm like, again, like four minutes behind the chat versus what you're seeing right now, but um, a little weird, hopefully for you guys. Um, okay, so again, the reason I'm applying absolute value here in the rotten difference is because sometimes the critics, the difference may be negative. Sometimes the critics may be positive, the difference there. So what I wanna do, um, is take the absolute value and then take the mean. And if we do this, you'll notice it's 15. So what does that actually mean? It means on average, so this is the mean, um, there's, there tends to be a difference of about 15 percentage points. Recall Rotten Tomatoes actually goes from zero to 100. And it looks like on average, there's a differential of like 15 percentage points between what critics say versus what uh, users say. Is that significant? Um, in the scale of 0 to 100, it's it's not too bad, right? I would expect there to be a difference. And 15%, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so what we can do as well is like do a distribution of the difference. So I could, if I wanted to, do something like sns.displot of this. And I could see uh, kind of a distribution on how far they are, and you can see for certain films, like for this particular film, what this is showing is there are certain films where uh, the difference is kind of huge, uh, but for most films, it looks like the distribution doesn't seem to be that bad. So again, the mean answered that we're off on average by like 15% between critics and users, but we can see here the distribution in general, um, many of them seem to just be like a few percentage points off. There's very few movies where there's a huge difference between the score of the critics and the users. Um, what we can do, is explore this with n smallest and n largest. This is actually very easy to do. So uh, kind of scrolling along here, I'm a little off from answering some questions in the notebook. So what I just created was this plot. This is the distribution for the raw difference. So you can see here, there's some movies that we score, uh, critics are scoring higher, some movies where users are scoring higher. And then this is kind of the absolute value just to see on average the differences. Um, and so what I wanna do is figure out I'm just, this is more of my curiosity than answering our original question, but what movies are actually causing these uh, larger differences? And you can easily answer this by saying all sites, and you can say n smallest. So you can say grab the five movies where the, um, where the difference is smallest. And remember, I'm actually saying um, not the absolute value of the difference, but the true difference. So we're gonna say rotten diff, I believe is what I called it. And here I, I just wanna grab the film name. So you can see right here, these are the five movies that have the s smallest, and recall there can be a negative difference between rotten difference, it's not the absolute value. But these are the end smallest where the m critics are essentially hating this movie and the users are loving it. Um, does this make sense? Uh, I haven't. I don't think I've seen any of these movies. So someone else, maybe in the chat, can who has seen these movies, maybe you can see like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That critics would not like this film, but uh, users would. Let's go ahead and see n largest. This would be films that critics love, but users tend to not like. Um, uh, I don't think I've seen any of these movies either. So again, maybe someone that's seen one of these movies can maybe understand like, oh yeah, it makes sense that uh, critics have liked this better. Um. Okay. All right, I just answered a question quickly in the chat. Definitely want to set up environments. Uh, okay, so we kind of got a little lost here. Um, there's way, this is a really interesting data set. We can keep playing around with differences between number of votes versus the rating of a movie, how critics and users rate movies differently. But recall, what we really want to know is, is Fandango artificially scoring movies higher? we have already basically proven that they are always displaying higher stars than the true rating if there is a rounding. That's already suspicious, right? Um, in fact, we saw, if we scroll back up here, 
based off this plot. Uh, where are you? This count plot we made. Um, so one thing that makes us extremely suspicious is um, we have only positive stars differences, right? In theory, there should be some negative stars differences. Um, so we're already very suspicious of Fandango. Um, and you'll notice that if you actually sum these up, um, you'll notice the sum of these bar plots is definitely way more um, as far as total count than the zero bar. So we already know that more often than not, Fandango is displaying a higher star rating than what the true rating it holds on the back end. But we could technically forgive this because it is they do have this issue of having to display uh, on a 0.5 scale versus kind of the point 0.1 true. Um, there's something like a one point star difference is definitely unforgivable because they definitely don't need to do that. They should have displayed four stars, not five stars on that one, right? Um, unless someone here in the chat saw Turbo Kid and thinks like, yeah, this was a five star movie. I don't know. I didn't see it. Um, I never even heard of it before doing this project. And you can also see 0.5 stars is also kind of crazy. And they're doing this for like, it's almost 40 movies that they're sh displaying a star rating that's 0.5 higher. That's crazy, right? Um, so we're already very suspicious of Fandango, but um, what's interesting here is we can already make a pretty good conclusion that Fandango is displaying higher ratings than it should on the stars. Um, but that is just from data, only from Fandango. What if we were to compare Fandango's rating to ratings from other websites? That should really tell us kind of almost for sure if they're artificially displaying higher scores, because if we see um, the distribution of scores on other websites versus Fandango, if there's an extreme difference there, then we know that it's not just an issue of stars being displayed versus ratings. We know it's an issue of um, Fandango just being way off base for some of these movies. So I'm going to scroll down here. I want to explain a couple of the tasks we do. Definitely you can check out the solutions video that's inside the course um, for a lot of the, for basically me coding out these tasks. You won't see uh, my face on the screen and because it's not a live stream. What we do is we explore also uh, the relationship between Metacritic scores and meta user critic scores. I also explore IMDB. We explore some outliers here, um, etc. But really what we want to jump to um, so that this analysis doesn't, so you're not here watching the stream all day, uh, is basically um, what are the Fandango scores versus all sites? Um, and if this was if this was truly live one to one, and this what there wasn't a delay, I would ask people here, what's the issue with um, the sites on all scores versus the uh, scores on Fandango? And the issue um, is recall like certain websites go from zero to one hundred, and Fandango goes from zero to five, right? So what I need to do is I need to either quote unquote normalize or standardize this in a way that all my scores off every single site goes from zero to five. There's a quick question here. Can you build a recommender system using this data set? Uh, it depends on what you define as a recommender system. What we could do is just recommend you high rated movies. That's essentially the best you can do from this because there's no real user data. Um, there, there are lots of uh, famous, uh, someone posted IMDB Kaggle data set. That, that's probably the most famous data set for uh, recommending movies. So you definitely wanna check that out if this is something that interests you. Uh, okay, so. What we're going to do is I want to combine Fandango with all sites. And what we can do is we can join them together. So what I'm going to say is kind of create a master data frame for our last analysis. Let me get some water here real quick. OK, uh, and I'm going to say PD merge. Recall I have two data frames. I'm not sure if it's helpful for me to look at this camera. It's a little weird because like it's looking up at me, but um, we have the Fandango data frame and the All Sites data frame, right? So what I want to do is I want to join them together, but I want to make sure that I'm only joining them for the films that are in both tables. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to say Fandango and All Sites. So we're going to merge these together, but recall if we actually take a look at All Sites, um, we can take the length of this data frame. You'll notice that All Sites only has 146 movies, and the length of Fandango has 504 movies. And in order to fairly make this uh, comparison, what I need to do is only compare movies that are in both All Sites and Fandango. And the way we can do that is say 
join them together on the film name column. If you notice all sites, the column is also called film. And to make sure I'm only joining for instances that are in both, that is an inner join. If you're familiar with uh, SQL join, um, someone said, what is credits? I'm not sure what they're referring to. Uh, uh, it follows horrible. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, uh, DF is PD merge. Uh, okay, so how inner, the, again, there's a deeper discussion this, of this in the uh, lecture videos when we, we actually have many videos on the different types of merges, but how inner, just it just makes sure that I'm only joining for films that are on both tables. So I'm only going to get essentially either 146 or less um, movies. I, I can't get all 504 when I merge these together. So let's run this. And now if I check out my data frame, let's just go ahead and check out info of it. You'll notice now it only has 145 movies. So there was only 145 movies that were in both Fandango and All Sites. So these are the 145 movies. I can fairly compare the ratings between them. Something to keep in mind though, is for DF, if I check out the head of this, I do have this issue where not every score is being shown from zero to five. So let's take a look at which ones I have to change. I have to change the Rotten Tomatoes and Rotten Tomatoes user to go from zero to 100 to zero to five. If I take a look at Metacritic and Metacritic user, the Metacritic score goes from zero to 100 and it changed that to zero to five. Metacritic user goes from, in a weird way, I'm not sure why it's different, but it goes from zero to 10. So I need to divide that by two to go from zero to five. IMDB, same thing, goes from zero to 10, I need to divide that. And then I don't actually care about the vote counts. That's not gonna fall in my comparison. And I also don't care about rotten difference. Really what I wanna do is just grab these columns right here and then adjust them. Many different ways you can do this, but one thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create normalized versions of these columns. And I'm kind of being a little, giving myself a lot of leeway by saying the word normalize. Um, so there are definitely ways that are kind of complex to transform a distribution that goes from zero to 100 to zero to five. But we're kind of lucky here in that this is a very basic analysis. So what I could do is if I had values that range from zero to 100, and I wanted to change them to a scale that goes from zero to five, and I know that the only value range possible is from zero to 100, I could just divide all those values by 20, right? Because let's imagine if I'm dealing with some rating, let's say on Rotten Tomatoes, it was rated 50. Well, what should that star rating from zero to five be? I know it should be 2.5, right? Right in the middle of zero to five. How can I do that? Well, I know that 100 divided by 20 is equal to five, which means if I just say 50 divided by 20, that's 2.5. So all I need to do is just divide this by the correct number. Um, and then round to the nearest 0.1 something, right? I don't want to have these values be like rated 4.36789, whatever, right? Um, okay, so how can I do this? It's actually now super easy, right? If the score range is from zero to 100, I'll simply divide by 20. If the score range is from zero to 10, I'll simply divide by two. So now I can easily transform ratings that go from zero to 100 to zero to five and zero to 10 to zero to five. The one thing to keep in mind here is just be careful when you're running these cells um, because def depending on the way you set this up, uh, you, you don't want to overwrite original values. Otherwise, if you run it more times, you, you'll keep dividing by 20 and keep dividing by two. All right, so we're, all, we're actually almost done, which is kind of exciting. Uh, we just need to get the normalized versions and then plot them out. So let's start with Rotten Tomatoes. I'm going to say Rotten Tomatoes normalized is equal to DF, Rotten Tomatoes. This score goes from zero to 100. So I'm just gonna divide all those values by 20. And then what I'm going to use is NP.round in order to round this to the nearest 0.1 decimal, because I wanna fairly compare uh, to Fandango because Fandango, its resolution, so to speak, is 0.1. Uh, <laughs> okay, good to, good to hear that you're seeing the colors nicely now, Nathan. Um, uh, I So yeah. Uh, a quick note on those color uh, mappings. I'm almost positive that the magma color mapping was specifically designed as uh, being okay for 
people that were colorblind. You, you'll have to check me on that. Um, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, and here it is. Sorry to. I, I'm seeing a, a chat like three minutes delayed, but I do think it's a very important topic uh, because you never know like who could be colorblind. Um, and if you're doing colors, this is important. So Matplotlib, again, kind of a quick aside, they have these perceptually uniform sequential color maps. In theory, these should be okay uh, for most colorblind users. There's different types of colorblindness, as I'm sure you guys are aware of. Um, so if you have a particular colorblindness, maybe that's an issue for you. But in general, uh, these five different color mappings should be okay. Um, even if the person is colorblind. And I think Vera, this is probably the best one. Um, it goes from purple to kind of this greenish yellows. Um, so just a quick kind of a side note on those color mappings. Um, all right, coming back. Um, but yeah, this is very cool that we had someone that was colorblind to uh, kind of chat, chat to us about this because it is really important. Um, okay, and what's also nice about those perceptually uh, uniform ones is if you convert it to grayscale, it should still be okay. So back to the topic at hand, uh, we have Rotten Tomatoes normalized. I'm going to round this off and then I'm also going to do the same thing, but this time for the users. Recall that we had two Rotten Tomato scores. We had Rotten Tomatoes and Rotten Tomatoes user. So I'm just going to say RTU norm. And then this one, the same deal, it goes from zero to hundred. So I will go ahead and run that. Now let's do the same thing for Metacritic. I'm gonna copy and paste this from my notes because uh, it's not, once you understand what I just wrote here, you don't need to see me type it again. But all we're doing here is the Metacritic score goes from zero to 100. So I'm gonna divide that by 20. The Metacritic user score, for whatever reason, it only goes from zero to 10. So I'm gonna divide it by two in order to get it to the range of zero to five. And then finally, I'm gonna do the same thing for uh, DF IMDB norm. And now all I've done here is I've just rounded all these kind of normalized versions. And if I take a look at the head of my data frame, you'll notice now if I scroll all the way to the right, I have these normalized versions that were also rounded to the nearest point one. And so now we're, we're almost ready to uh, finish this off and compare, what I want to do is just grab a data frame of the normalized scores. So what I'm going to say is normalized scores is equal to, and a very quick way to grab these values is I think to say DF columns, and then just grab here all these normalized ones, copy paste, this saves you a lot of typing. These are all the normalized scores. What I also want are my original film stars and rating. I actually just want stars and rating. I don't care about the film title for this particular case. But let's go ahead and put that in and put a comma. So what I have here is Fandango stars, Fandango's ratings, and then all the normalized scores from the rest of these websites. So we're almost there. And since I know there's like a four minute delay here, I'm just going to say this now in the video. By the time you're watching this, it may be a good time to just post general questions you want me to answer as we kind of conclude this project. So I check out these normalized scores. Um, and whoops, this is now a list. So I'm going to say normalized score columns. And let's go ahead and say normalized scores, the data frame, underscore DF, is equal to DF of norm score columns. And so now if I check this out, whoops, put a new cell here, norm scores DF, we are ready to go. Basically all that work was to get to this data frame. This is the data frame and you should also like, there should be alarm bells ringing right now that you'll notice the very first movie is 4.0 and 3.9 on Fandango and it's absolutely rated horribly on the other websites. So hopefully you're already like, what the F, <laughs> excuse my language, but what the heck's going on here, right? Um, very, very suspicious of Fandango right now. Um, but uh, we're just human. I can't just like instantly read this data frame and understand what's going on. So now it's time to do a plot. There's many different ways we can plot this out. Um, one thing we can do here is just simply say SNS dot KDE plot. And I can pass in this normalized score data frame. So I can say my data is equal to this. And this should actually kind of instantly uh, show us 
the plot here and then we can begin resizing it and filling it in. So I could say something like fill is equal to true. It's going to start filling those in. What I can also do is um, begin to clip this off from 0 to 5, run that, and then this should probably be a way larger plot, right? So let's go ahead and do the following. Let's say PLT fig size, whoops, PLT fig size is equal to, let's make this much larger because we have a lot of information here. Um, at, whoops, PLT figure, sorry. Fig size is equal to 15 by, I don't know, 6 and then make the DPI way higher, probably like 200 DPI. And this is kind of uh, the main plot we were trying to get. In fact, if we actually take a look back at the article here, this is essentially the same plot they showed here. They didn't show the kind of nice KDE curves that they pointed out, but what's really cool is you can see them clipping it as well on the five star mark, even though their shading kind of uh, shows that it would go beyond that. So what do we have here? And later on, I'll, I'll kind of tell you, there's like an error with uh, Seaborn for this latest version that causes this issue um, about this legend. But what do we have here? Notice the curves of stars. That's this blue curve all the way on the end. We can also kind of make this a different palette if we wanted to. Um, but what I really want to show is, let's even try to make this wider if we can. Um, did I just make it taller? Yeah, let's try to make it wider. There we go. Okay, so here's our nice finalized plot. This is kind of the answer to our question. Is Fandango artificially displaying higher scores? And uh, are their scores unreasonable? You'll notice that we have this um, blue and orange curve. Recall blue right here. This is showing you what the rating is actually displayed as on Fandango. Notice how much higher it is and how much more skewed and pushed to the right um, than it is for all the other rating sites. Um, in fact, the next curve that is closest to it is the Fandango backend rating, right? So we actually have to get to something like uh, the, I believe this color is IMDB normalized score before we can see kind of where people are on average rating their films. So you'll notice if we just take a look at, and I know this might be a little hard to see on your guys' end, so you can actually open up the solutions notebook that's available to you in the zip if you wanna, um, or maybe you weren't able to follow along as quickly as me. We do have this already for you. So again, open up Capstone Project Solutions. This chart is here for you. Um, but I can see here that it looks like on average, most films are being rated around maybe three, three and a half stars. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, right? You would expect most stars on average to fall kind of right in the middle-ish, maybe a little higher than average, uh, between zero and five. Um, and what's really interesting is look at the Rotten Tomatoes critic score. These are kind of professional critics. Um, say what you want about the Rotten Tomato critics. I know a lot of people complain about them, but you can see they're actually very even-handedly delivering scores, right? For them, there are just about as many five-star movies as there are four-star movies, as there are three-star, two-star, one-star, zero-star movies. Here we can see Fandango clearly way beyond what is reasonable for movies. In fact, they just, they love movies, right? For these movies, you can see they pretty much never rated a movie less than two stars. Um, so even compared to other websites that are kind of generous in their ratings, like uh, IMDB ratings here, um, the stars and rating uh, issue uh, is quite clearly Fandango pushing stuff beyond what they should be doing. Um, and there's many different ways you can continue to uh, check this out. In fact, if you want, you can just check out um, like the DF. Let's just directly compare only Rotten Tomato normalized versus stars. So this, this is kind of a fun comparison that I like to do towards the end of this project is compare the stars displayed on Fandango versus our kind of quote unquote most trusted source, the Rotten Tomatoes official critics, right? These are professional movie critics. Um, their scores normalized on Rotten Tomatoes. And just look at this difference. This difference should essentially speak for itself, right? You can see here that professional critics for these movies, they're more or less rating them 
about the same. There, there does seem to be more higher rated movies in the data set, but the stars being displayed is kind of insane here. Um, so uh, there's obviously lots more analysis you can do. Um, something that I enjoyed doing for this particular project was a cluster map. And we described a cluster map uh, in a little more detail in the course. And I know we're kind of uh, ending on our time here, although you know, obviously I can stream all day. But um, what we do is, so here we can see the different plots we created, um, comparing everything. The plot here uh, was Rotten Tomato um, critics versus the stars being displayed. So huge differential here, very suspicious. Um, this basically kind of proves that Fandango is artificially rating stuff compared to normal critics. And we'll also see here, you could do this also as a histogram. It's not as readable, but you can still see the stars rating, those bars are way higher than average. Um, there's this idea of a cluster map. Uh, it's actually really easy to create, but it might not be as easy to interpret. So I'm gonna show you how to create this cluster map. All you say is norm scores DF, and then choose a color mapping. I think we're complaining about uh, some other coloring. So I'm just gonna say Virtus and column cluster is equal to false. And let's run this and I'm gonna kind of explain what this is actually showing. Okay, uh, so what is this showing us here? What a cluster map does is it's going to look at all the films and films that are rated similarly across multiple websites. It's going to kind of reorganize the data frame. Um, oh, interesting, I think. Um, it's going to reorganize the data frame to try to put uh, similar movies together. So what is this actually showing us here? You'll notice that the color bar, if it's a very dark color, that means these movies tend to be uh, poorly rated. It's a very high color, that means the movies are better rated. So you would expect to see here on the columns, these are the different websites, right? Over the horizontal, those are the actual movie IDs. So what we're thinking of, if every single rating website was rating movies similarly, we would expect that these horizontal lines in general would have the same lightness or darkness to them on the rows. So what does that actually mean? It looks like these movies right here, these are the movies that are absolutely horrible. Um, they, they pretty much uh, kind of universally are not very good. And you can see that the other people are also rating them quite poorly. That's why they're darker colors here, right? Um, so you'll notice Rotten Tomatoes users really didn't like these movies. And it's also dark on these other uh, rating websites, which makes sense, right? Metacritic users and IMDb users also not rating these too favorably. They're kind of more dark than they are yellow. But look at the difference here when it comes to stars being displayed. You'll notice that this, these movies that are very dark, meaning very poorly rated, are actually being displayed quite highly on um, Fandango. So this is another way to visualize what we just showed up here, except it's kind of showing it on 2D for every single film. It's taking like the films into account. It's kind of the same info, but just a different way to visualize this. Um, okay, so kind of interesting with that cluster map. And, and this is a visualization that visualization that is not in the article. Um, but I, I thought it was a really interesting kind of display of just how much Fandango is really pushing some of these movies. So let's go ahead and start looking at uh, what are the Rotten Tomato Critics uh, worst films. So what I'm going to do is grab the worst films based off the Rotten Tomato Critics users rating. I'm going to scroll all the way down for this. It, it ends up being, I think, taken three here. So we're gonna say the following. Uh, let's go ahead and grab our normalized film DF. Um, uh, there was a quick question here. Uh, yes, we do explain the, I'm just gonna chat it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so normalized scores DF. What I'm gonna do is say, get me the worst or N smallest. So the smallest rating values possible. Give me the 10 worst films based off uh, RT normalized. So you can see they are here. Um, what I actually need to do is kind of check these out based off the film title. So what I need to do is actually grab that film again. Let's go ahead and grab that in. What I can do is say DF 
let's just grab uh, stars. Essentially, what I want to do is figure out what are the 10 movies that were basically rated the worst by Rotten Tomatoes critics and how were they rated or displayed the rating on Fandango. So we can see stars um, for that display and then RT norm. And for this particular case, I actually also want to see the film title. So we'll say film. And then what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and grab the end smallest here. Recall norm scores DF only had the ratings. It didn't have the film title. So what I'm going to do is run this cell and that should, let's see, uh, whoops, forgot a bracket there. There we go. Okay. So I think this is really going to speak for itself here, but um, we can see, recall Rotten Tomatoes are official movie critics, right? Um, and these are the 10 worst films according to people who's basically it's their job to uh, rate films. Um, and these are the stars being displayed by uh, Fandango. So what can we kind of see from this? Basically, I think Taken 3 is the worst offender here. Paul Blart, Ball Cop 2 also. Um, essentially, none of these films are very good. Um, I do use OBS Studio. Uh, we can see RT Norm, 0 0.2, stars, uh, 3.5. So clearly... If you went back in time to 2015, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, the critics would have rated Taken 3 0 0.4 out of 5 stars, and your uh, Fandango would have displayed a 4.5. So it ends here, kind of the end of the project. Um, we kind of pretty much prove that Fandango is definitely juicing their scores. So there is a conflict of interest um, because obviously they want to rate movies higher so they can sell more tickets. Um, and it is kind of uh, a an issue here. Okay, so um, I am looking at the live stream and it looks like we're still doing the, uh, I may be like five minutes behind here, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so I'm gonna type in here because there's the delay. There is a delay. that I can't answer. Um, uh, there was, I'm going to, there were some questions posted, uh, I think through Google Forms. Let me pull those up real quick. Whoops. Uh, let me bring back also the stream. Where are you? Here we go. Uh, okay, so there was a couple of questions people posted um, on the stream, or uh, there was a Google form on the stream questions. Uh, there weren't actually that many because, you know, the course is still new. I think there was a total of like 10 questions. Uh, Okie dokes. Um, I'm just going to answer the questions that were put in the Google form as we kind of finish this off. Uh, what are the main projects we need to work for data science for our portfolio? Uh, I would say maybe choose some Kaggle projects, but then after doing maybe two to three Kaggle projects, really focus on a topic that interests you and see if you can apply data science and programming to it. Um, so uh, something you can do is check out, um, the United States is pretty good at uh, releasing a lot of data. So there's something called data.gov. So maybe if you're interested in your particular counties, like water supply metrics and how that's changed over time or something like that. I would highly recommend that you leverage what you're interested in and combine it with data science. So that way you can, if you're presenting this to a future employer or something like that, they can tell that you're passionate about this. Don't just choose based off the data set, choose based off what your own interests are um, because there's probably gonna be a data set based off your interests. Um, uh, there was a question on, uh, where should we be in the course for the next stream? Uh, I would say hopefully by the next stream, you're pretty familiar with pandas and NumPy um, and, and visualization. You should probably be about like where you should be for the capstone project. Um, uh, we're going to try to keep it. What I don't want for the stream is that like 
everyone had to have finished the course in order for the stream to be useful for them, right? So we want to try to present things in a way that it's useful, hopefully regardless of where you are. I hope that even if you knew nothing about Python and you watched this stream, you could at least see what's possible with Python. Um, okay, uh, a couple of other questions here now I'm seeing in the chat. I know the video is still going up. Well, you have a three, four minute delay. Um, uh, thank you for the, uh, let's see, please note that it says I need to do implement an AI. Please tell me to approach the AR part. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand this question, uh, unless I'm missing half of it. Oh, I see. For example, if my input is equal to football, it should return a list of users who have an interest in football. Uh, oh, sorry, there's like a bunch of them. Uh, do I need to write, yeah. Uh, go ahead and, well, by the time you're using this, I'm not sure I fully understand this question about AI and input is equal to football. Um, maybe you can post that question on the next stream or something. Um, is there an easy way to tell Seaborn to pick colors further apart in the given palette? Uh, no, there actually isn't. Um, I know, I know exactly what you mean, right? So Nathan, like, you can give it something like magma, and it, depending on how many different categories it has, 